Daisy Set Alert. We've published a paper showcasing a new resource which is going to be used to examine the impact of the atmosphere on melting of Antarctic Peninsula ice shelves. In the first of a two-part series, we present this new data set and demonstrate its ability to capture the most important processes related to melt over the Larsen Sea ice shelf. It's a high-resolution, multi-decadal, regional climate model hindcast driven by reanalysis. But wait, why are we doing this in the first place? Larsen Sea and Antarctica in general is a relatively under-observed place. It's hard to get scientists down there to take measurements and we have to rely on automatic weather stations. We've only got a handful of those and even the ones that we do have haven't really been there that long. So the next best thing is to use very detailed computer models that can tell us what's going on. And the added benefit of models is that they can give us an idea of how processes happen in three dimensions. Lots of different models have been used to simulate conditions over Larsen C each with their own individual strengths and weaknesses. However, the real aim of the game is to make sure that any model can capture the real life patterns of surface melting and the atmospheric conditions that are shown from the limited observations that we do have. Crucially, the east-west gradient in surface melting that is driven by the occurrence of fern winds. These warm, dry winds occur in the immediate lee of steep terrain, just like we have on the Antarctic Peninsula. Satellite observations show that melting is concentrated in the inlets closer to the mountains, as well as further north where temperatures are warmer and we get more solar energy reaching the surface of the ice shelf. However, many models have historically failed to fully capture this phenomenon, and that is where this hindcast comes in. We show in our paper that the MetUM hindcast is pretty good at simulating the atmospheric and surface melting conditions over the ice shelf in all seasons and during fern and also non-fern periods. Importantly, the hindcast shows the sort of patterns in surface melting that we expect. So a north-south gradient related to the higher temperatures and solar radiation that you see further north, as well as that east-west gradient superimposed on top that's related to the incidence of those warm, dry fern winds. To really drill down into the specifics and show what the hindcast is capable of, we look at two case studies. Now, the first one is the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf in 2002. The months immediately before Larsen B's demise were unusually warm, with lots of fern winds and lots of melting, which ultimately were responsible for the Larsen B's demise. It completely disintegrated via the process of hydrofracturing, and if you'd like a refresher or an explainer on the process of hydrofracturing, check out my video up here. The second case we look at is autumn 2016, that's March to May for you Northern Hemisphere folks, when unusually high melting, again associated with fern, was observed. We published a paper on this actually in 2018 that looked at the mechanisms behind this event, but we couldn't really put it into a longer term context. Since then, a few papers have done that, and we also look at that season in comparison to the full 20 years of the hindcast. Sure enough, when we plot how often fern events occur as a percentage of time, March to May 2016 emerges as a very fern-heavy season. I mean, just look at this compared to the average for the whole 20 years. Like we showed in our previous work, that is down to the huge sensible heat fluxes associated with fern, so the delivery of warm, dry air which provides the energy for melting and raises the temperatures far enough to do that. Altogether, it produces that east-west gradient that we've come to expect from fern, with the majority of melting happening closest to the mountains. In the next part of the series, we delve deeper into the causes of melting on Larsen C, ranking them in order of importance to pick out the most important processes that are going on, and, crucially, what this might mean for the future. You can find the hindcast data archived on CEDA with a full description of the methods, and also the paper is linked below. So drop any comments or questions that you have in the comments box below and make sure you like and share the video and also don't forget to hit that subscribe button. See you soon.